Pinkerton's Ghosts is a horror anthology podcast by Superversive Radio, with no affiliation with any detective agency, person real or imagined, or the dark forces of Outreterre. It is not intended for children. I'm back. You can't put Jack Morrow down. Grigory Hovath asked his last question. I can tell you would give much for a guaranteed shot to kill me, but I ain't a man for dying. Now here's my question. Will you come quietly? I glared at him and stood. He stood up at the same time. He wasn't a man to dirty his own hands, but I guessed he preferred his family to have cleaner hands than his. I could respect that. You aren't going to kill me. He smiled, but kept his gun on me. I kept my eyes on it. You're right. I've got other tricks and other family members. Come on out. You too, Max. There were many doors out of this room. I heard them open to the sides and behind me. Most were large men, as tall as I was, but broad like the barns they spent a lot of their time in. They all wielded bidents, prongs flared, to keep me from moving. A couple also had those nooses on a stick I had seen some animal control men bear. In front, a girl in a black dress walked out to stand beside her father. I could smell witchery on her. She wasn't wearing a bunch of pentagrams or any of the nonsense stuff the usual edgy teen could find in their dying mall, but just a sensible black dress almost pilgrim-like. She wore black eyeshadow and black socks and black shoes. Her left eye was missing. I could see the veins pop and pulse behind a large eye patch. She didn't act like her left side was blind. This was Margaret, or rather, Mags. I had met her once. She hadn't been cheerful, but she hadn't been so monochromatic either. Still, she had filled out nicely in her twenties, and I didn't want to smash her porcelain-like face. She was probably the most dangerous of the lot. Most men don't fight other men, especially ones like me, who have reputations. They were going to drive me into a corner and hold me down while they got the nooses over my head. They'd keep their distance, waiting for the right time to drive me back. Women don't do that. Mother spent a lot of time teaching me tricks, but she played dirty. Mags wouldn't be here without a trick of her own. Grigory was presenting a sort of wall to me. Either I go forward where he'd probably shoot me in the foot with my own gun, or Mags would perform some witchery, or I'd try my luck with the men behind me. There was also Abdul. That name wasn't familiar to me. I was a cornered rat. I needed control. I needed backup. I needed someone to help me. In the seconds that I had as the men adjusted for where I was standing, and all the tables and benches were in the way, I swore I'd never let anything like this go on for so long again. I know I'm not leadership material, but I swore that I'd do everything in my power to bring the paranormal Pinkertons back, no matter the cost. I made the first move. The bench I sat on was light for its seven-foot length. The generator began to cough and choke loudly. There were no windows here, so I hoped, prayed, even as I picked up the bench to use as a shield between me and whatever horror show Mags was hiding under their eye patch. Mags! His leg! Get his leg! Something coughed horribly in the generator, and my prayers were answered. The lights went out. It was total darkness. I ran forward. My path was pretty straightforward. I needed that 1911 back. There were several shouts of, It's dark. Where is he? I'll get the generator. Someone opened up a door to the side. Dad, Abdul's here. He's early. The voice tripped over his own feet and fell. I had my plan. A purple beam passed by my head. It sought to the left, missing me. Then it hit the bench. The wood turned to stone under my fingers. 
The beam didn't touch my fingers, but everywhere the beam played, a little pool about a foot in diameter turned to stone. I threw the bench before it got too heavy. Mag shouted in alarm, and the beam turned aside as she saw the bench coming. It tumbled and rolled over them. I was rewarded with Mag's scream and Grigory's wheedling roar of surprise. I ran to where the bench rolled to a stop. Grigory's gun went off close, but he aimed where he thought I would be. His life was worth more to him than his deal with Abdul. I caught Grigory's hand and wrenched the gun from it. I heard his wrist snap. Max, look at round my hand. Where the gun went off, girl, he's there. Max turned her head. I could see what she had done to herself or what had been done to her. A purple eye, black with neon pink rings and dots like stars in a cyberpunk sky, glowed in her left socket. I had never seen a thing like that before. The veins around her sinister eye glowed with power. I could see scars all up and down her eye like someone had carved out her eyelids, too. Whatever her power was, she was in danger of it as much as I was. I dove to the side. The beam missed me, but hit her father's hand. It turned to stone, and the fingers crumbled. Grigory screamed. His muscles shuddered, and the hand tried to clench even as it turned to stone. The whole statue cracked and bled. His daughter screamed in panic, and as I watched, the pink-purple light of the petrifying beam hit the hand down to the bone, and then turned the bone to dust. I ran while the panic and darkness worked for me. I kicked the guy who announced Abdul and ran past him. One or two of the others had the wits enough to chase after me, but I had the lead. The generator didn't come back on, so I ran with one arm to the wall. I had a feeling that the dining room was a central chamber to the complex. I kept my back to what I remembered of it. I checked my magazine, and I had four bullets left. I ran out of the door and into the forests. I could tell I was somewhere in the Arkansas Ozarks. The ground and trees felt right for it. The humidity was not so thick as Missouri. It was cooler, and it was night. I looked up at the stars. Before I could get a bearing, a car pulled up, brights on. I shielded my eyes. Before the car stopped, a man exited, almost floating on air was dressed in the very stereotype of an Arabian mystic. His flowing robes were ornate, sewn in patterns that boggled eyes and portended strange mysteries and stories I had never heard before. The man's face was sharp, with a sharp chin, sharp nose, and sharper eyes. There was a bemused smile on his lips, and he lightly tugged the tip of his goatee with thickly ringed hands. I fired my gun at him, but the bullet passed through his robes. He laughed loudly, with joy. Look me in the eyes if you would kill me, Jack Morrow. Come, pit your beast's soul against my animal magnetism. I couldn't resist. I stared deeply into his eyes. They were brown and black, wheels within wheels. His will enveloped mine without me giving even the slightest bit of resistance. I fell to my knees. My world was his eyes. I could not see his feet, and so it looked like he floated towards me, his left hand reaching out, his eyes larger than stars, galaxies. I cried out for deliverance in my mind. I saw the shadow behind him, not possessing him, but serving. Its form grew more and I saw a stern face like the face of a djinn I had seen in ancient copies of the Thousand and One Nights. They were right to hire me to capture you. Your martial skill is without human peer, but your mind and soul are less disciplined. He spoke, melodic and calming. He could have described a building falling down with sound effects and have much the same effect. Grigory was an unwilling servant, but he has completed the barest letter of our agreement. You are under my power. 
I shall deliver you to the secret temple of the Grand Masons. Where they will. Well, I do not care. I am not their filth. He came closer, gliding over rocks and a creek as if the ground was too unholy to touch. The spirit, the gin on his shoulder, also reaching out, its hands came close to touching me. I could not think, not even to cry out in my own soul now. His eyes were more than a god to me, more than my own mother, more than the Pinkertons. They were my universe. It is a joke of a law, you see, that the Satanists and the Kabbalists have so much money, which they will give to me for a package that comes willingly. If only they knew how to ask. Stand straight, Jack Morrow. Let me see you. Come to me. I have potions that will make your soul feel light as air. I stood. My soul of souls can give you pleasant dreams. My master, before I overthrew him, often quoted the prophet's secret book of Jinni, saying, Life and pleasure are as worms to the fish in the ocean. All come, few bite, fewer still catch. Though it is more poetic in my native tongue, I will give you the life you have always wanted. Perhaps with that witch who thought herself so clever when she put out her eye for the eye of a cockatrice. I doubt you know any women worth fantasizing about. Well, your choice is mine to make. And I promise the dream will not leave, even when the knife enters your heart, or the fires are lit so that you may be cast to them. You will not so much as scream. Ah, the dreams will be so pleasant. Hell, which all Kafirs go to, will be made all the worse for you. With a motion I could not have consciously made, I fired my gun down into the ground. The bullet cut the skin of my leg around the calf. It did not break the muscles or the tendons, but it broke the spell. I shouted in pain and ran. The arms of the djinn closed around nothing. My soul told me to run, 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 run without stopping. I did not until I felt the pressure of Abdul's gaze leave me. Ho ho! The Arab laughed good-naturedly. I saw him pull out a stoppered flask from his sleeve. It was made of sapphires and glittered like the starry sky above. From it he poured twice onto the ground. I reached the top of the cliff and pulled myself over. Two shadows formed into dogs, black thunder-headed mist in canine form. I ran into the woods. First, I had to figure out exactly what I was fighting. I knew this wasn't anything like the Geisterhund gas, which had a grayish color that was more billowy than the two dogs made by the sorcerer. If I could get my hands on a cross or a Bible, I could probably dispel them. I didn't trust my firearm, just because I doubted the Arabian would send something after me. I could so easily dispatch. The two dogs howled like thunder, the noise setting my sinuses to pulse. I tasted blood. Lightning struck somewhere nearby, even though no clouds floated above. Thunder did not follow the lightning. Something in the back of my mind told me the chase was on. They were hunting me now, and would not stop until they caught me. My mother and I made and kept many stashes of weapons, supplies, and other goods necessary in this line of work, all over the Ozarks, Arkansas, and Missouri. 
I knew Grigory would do the same. I ran for where I would place a secret hatch out of his mountain compound. There were a few places where such a thing can be placed. Even with the nearby stores under the earth, I knew the man would have a little hidey hole nearby. I found it almost exactly where I expected it. Within a large pile of rocks piled in such a way to hide the entrance, but not prevent someone from leaving. I ran my hand up and down the hatch until I found a faint arrow carved into the concrete. I followed the arrow, running up the mountain until I stepped on a wooden hatch. I dropped to my hands and knees and uncovered the entrance. It wasn't much, just some bug-out bags, a set of shotguns, handguns, and plenty of ammo magazines, clips, and boxes of shells for the weapons inside. Within a moment, I had a harness over the shirt I took from Grigory's nephew. I loaded what I could to it. The thunder was getting close. Very close. Soon I had something like an arsenal that I was used to. I kept the 1911 in my back holder and took a 9mm and some magazines for it. The shotgun was loaded, and I had more ammo. It wasn't an 1887, one of the Mossberg pump numbers, but it served. I ran the opposite way from the rolling thunder, coming ever closer. I didn't dare stay longer than I had to, nor stand and fight without something to put my back against. I didn't know the capabilities of these thunder dogs or black shucks or whatever these things were. I felt inferior, in a way. I wasn't a magician or trafficked with powers or... I don't know. I, I didn't have much to do with that stuff. I preferred to kill it. The old Shawnee didn't have much potential either. He claimed he could dance the ghost dance and make it stick. Apparently it worked like a time loop. As long as you had the will to keep fighting, you were allowed to return to the ghost dance. He told me that whenever you gave up and accepted fate, that was it. I oriented myself to the north. I had more cachets up there. The old Shawnee could communicate with animals, or they allowed him to command them. I'm not sure which. He claimed it was a sort of peace, an authority that came from Adam. I've seen other guys like this. I've never understood it, nor made it work for me. I searched my memories for something, anything of the facts he beat into me about being chased by supernatural monsters. The thing was that Bigfoots weren't considered supernatural. A lot of cryptids, too, were just strange or rare animals with spooky powers. Skinwalkers, certain types of wendigos, black shucks, and unicorns were supernatural, and I've killed all of them at some point or another, besides skinwalkers. There were some things that followed rules, some things that didn't. The old Shawnee's words finally came to me. I had to find running water, a residence of Christians, or a church. I mentally crossed off the residence, bringing others in on purpose would likely lead to their deaths, and it was unlikely I'd find one besides. Running water would be relatively easy to find in the Ozark Mountains. They were absolutely full of springs and water. The church would also be easy once I found civilization. The trick would be finding one that had a proper spirit to it. Many Christians were not Christians at all, but culturally Christian. They didn't believe in it any more than an unbeliever, but they said all the right words, and they looked good on Sundays. The real key was that they were never tested, nor made any action on their true belief. A church that had never had a true believer cross its threshold was an empty building with a deep miasma of misery from the foundation to the steeple. I remember Timothy Pullman, who died on a mission in 2014, telling me about a town that had been depopulated due to a church imploding into itself. It turned into a sort of supernatural black hole that tore apart every human relationship in 20 miles. The town had to be abandoned. None of the families were the same if they even survived. Everything evil hidden by a facade of hypocrisy was released into the open in a single night. I leaped over a brook, its origin a few hundred feet away, so I didn't trust it, to do more than slow them down for a few seconds. 
I kept up a good pace, not pushing myself for too long. I trusted my body, but not how much it had healed. The thunder was close now. It stopped at the brook, but it came closer, sooner than I thought. Maybe running water wasn't the right track. I held out hope for the church. If I got to a road or discovered where I was, I could make a beeline. The stars weren't giving me enough hints. I ran down the mountains, cutting diagonal across a scree line and making the valley. I had become so used to roots and branches that I nearly tripped when I hit the flat ground of a road. It wasn't paved. I headed right. I couldn't see any lights either way. It had the nondescript feel of a government road for park rangers. Considering my experience and the bones of the giant's case, I'd avoid them. I used the road to speed up, running most of the way to the gate. I vaulted it and saw the first of the Thunderhead wolves come through the forest. Its eyes glowed yellow and sparked within its own skull. When it saw me, it opened its mouth and shot lightning. The electricity set my hair on edge, but struck the metal gate before me. It didn't try again. Instead, it leapt the fence. I prayed that the lead in the buckshot could deal with the charge and fired it into its body. Each of the buckshot rounds punched a hole through the storm cloud body and took with it a yellow spark that flashed and twisted in the air. The clouds fell back and reformed. It twisted and reeled like a dog that had just rammed a fence in an attempt to devour the jerk of a mailman. I used that time, slotting in another round to replace the one I fired. I might have stunned it, but I could tell I hadn't done any real damage. Hunt enough things, and you can tell when a death wound has been delivered, especially for non-corporeal beings. The next came at me from the side. I got the drop on this one as it ran to flank me. The buckshot nearly tore through this one like the first, but it had enough time to erect a cage of blue and white lightning, catching the buckshot and slowing the pellets enough that they were caught in the clouds of the thing. With a crack like stone shattering, the buckshot flew back at me, leaving trails of white mist and yellow sparks. One of the little pieces cut my side. The pain caught me off guard. I saw red and lost my temper. I roared with the pain and rage. My pride blinded me and wrath erupted from my soul like a geyser. I was Jack Morrow. I hunted the beasts of the night. I was the hunting dog. I was the nightmare's nightmare, and I wasn't going to back down from these beasts. I'd find Abdul in whatever tower his sorcerers kept, and tear it down with black powder and steel. I'd burn the ashes of the Temple of the Grand Masons, and nothing, no power of night or darkness would ever tread on any lands I held as Stuart before the God Almighty. Their altars would be broken, their leaders slaughtered, and their gods a crippled remnant, whose only memories being the untranslatable carved stones in the ruins of dead and buried civilizations. I ranted and cursed, swearing dreadful oaths. I'm ashamed of myself. I fired my shotgun into the thundercloud again and again. It caught the first one and sent it back to me, and more little pellets tore my flesh and scarred my skin. The second it caught two, and the third as well. It came so fast on the heels that it couldn't fire back and the lead broke through. The lead isn't very magnetic, but it just has enough. The second and third clusters were fired back as one larger one, and more of my blood spilled on the ground at my feet. I didn't pay attention to the one behind me. I was senseless to everything except the one idea. I had to kill the thundercloud dog, no matter how much pain it could throw back at me. The fourth and fifth shots broke the lightning shield it made around itself. The thunder and lightning were diminished now, and it struggled to catch them. It fired back. A few pellets pierced my skin, but not deep. Some even bounced off. A single pellet pierced my cheek and cracked a tooth, bouncing up into the flesh at the roof of my mouth. Blood poured down my throat and through my teeth. I fired my last shell, and the dog had no energy to catch it. Instead, it tore through the clouds, and the spark went out of it. 
but the body remained, slowly pulling together. I stumbled forward. I couldn't stop the bleeding. There was too much. My body rebelled against me, keeping me from moving forward. Instead, I just stood there, some twenty feet from a paved road. I couldn't take another step, no matter how much I grit my teeth and demanded my body keep moving. I didn't know I had water in me to weep, but I did. I wasn't in control of myself, but it didn't matter. The training to be a Pinkerton is harsh so that you don't lose control. I was supposed to be the best active Pinkerton, and I couldn't do it. Maybe I couldn't rebuild anything. I just wanted to retreat back to my little hideaways, waiting for an order from control that might kill me, might not, but I'd go because somebody has to. I was praying then. I apologized for losing my temper and making a rash oath. I asked for strength, but I got peace instead. I couldn't move at all. I could barely blink. I'd just bleed out and die, and that would be it. No family, no legacy, nothing to remember me by. Jim and Sean would get killed sometime, or fall to evil, or be in a fairy harem. Or just leave a life of ingratitude and poor salaries that was the paranormal Pinkerton life. I couldn't save myself, so I asked God to. He didn't say anything. For another long minute, I stood there, quietly weeping, tears running down my face, angry and sad and despairing, and hoping in a ball of emotions I didn't know the name for. I just had nothing, was nothing. I could feel the energies dispersed by whatever mix Grigory had made his buckshot from, gather back into the clouds behind me. I put steel into my back. I wouldn't beg. If God willed that I die here, I accepted it. Maybe he meant for me to be drawn in, and pull a Samson on the Grand Masons, tear it all down around their ears, because they had a match and left it a little close to me. I would just reach out, grab it, and set something on fire. Horrible way to die, but it would give the Grand Masons a taste of what's to come. Instead, lights came down the road. Headlights. It was Abdul. I couldn't clench my hands or even unclench them, much less reach for my 1911 or the 9mm I took from Grigory. I stared at the approaching lights without comment. It was a truck. Two men came out and came close. It was an Abdul. Well, damnation, it's a man. And clouds? What are those things, Bob? I don't know, Jim. I don't like it. If ever the devil were a dog, it was them. The first one, Bob, gasped. Damnation, he's bleeding out. Come on, help me and we'll take him to St. Anthony in the county over. No time to lose. I've seen something like this in Desert Storm. Thunder rolled over the three of us and silenced his story. The two of them grabbed me and dragged me by my shoulders to the back of their truck. Jim, the shorter of the two, stayed with me in the truck bed next to a gutted deer carcass. It wasn't warm, but it wasn't unpleasantly cold. I couldn't see any ticks. Small mercies. The thunder broke again as the truck roared away. The next bit of thunder was closer, even with the speed Bob was pushing to. We got into town. I didn't know what town or country we were in. Jim was pointing and shouting at something I couldn't see. I was half propped up against the dead deer and thinking morbid thoughts. I could see wisps of black clouds nipping at the bumper. Bob watched them, and whenever one of them slowed down enough to gather up charge for a lightning blast, he dodged, and the lightning missed by inches. We passed through the town, its businesses, its churches, and its houses. Nothing happened except the chase. Something tolled in the night. A bell rang at an hour that anyone but me, as I was bleeding out in the back of a truck with a dead deer as a pillow, would call ungodly. Jim heard it, too. What was that? Bell! I groaned. Jim saw my lips move and came close. Bell! Oh, to the bell, the bell! Jim understood. He climbed over me to the cabin and banged on the roof. What? 
Jim pointed in the direction of the bell sound. But that's been abandoned for years, hell, by my pappy's time. Jim said something and pointed again. Weird enough as it is. Damn, nation, we're trusting a half-dead man. He turned down a side street. I lost track of the dogs when the bells tolled. Now they came back. This time, when the lightning leapt from their mouths, it struck the truck. The engine stalled and then exploded. Fire broke out on the gas tank and the engine ahead. Bob lost control and the truck rolled, throwing me and Jim into the air. I lost sight of Bob. Jim struck the wall of a church, his head at a funny angle. Somewhere in the forest, the truck exploded into a proper fireball. Not so much a shock wave as a burst of fire and heat. I now experienced the glorious pain of any number of ribs and bones shattering. I could do nothing but face my end with a stoic disposition. I know prayer is infinite, as long as we have the will to say them. But I had no prayers left. I waited. The Thunderheads came close, sniffing, and turning their heads this way and that. They saw me, prone, unmoving, and came close. Get away from my son! My mother ran out of the broken church door with a strange weapon like a lightning rod and a trumpet mixed together. It fired bolts of lightning into the thunder dogs, and they expanded like balloons, growing bigger and bigger. Their clouds became fluffy, then massive, until they hit limits and popped, the clouds flowing over the forest floor and thinning until they were no more. Jack, I thought you didn't need your mama no more. I groaned. I tried to say, I didn't. I didn't get it out, and probably for the best. She took me in and looked me over. She was tall for a woman, and thin, hatchet-faced. Severe. I knew from the rare old pictures that she had been pretty in the 80s, that big hair look they had, but now she was tired, old, and I knew she was old, which was worse. I knew she was halfway into her forties, but uh, being a paranormal Pinkerton, or just being in the life ages you if you're not on the side with all the goodies. She didn't have much more than the strength to drag me up the stairs and down into the dry cellar. Certainly not in a comfortable way, either. Well, I better get to work. Can't let the gangrene set in. She pulled out medicine and pliers. This is going to hurt, but you know I love you, right? I winked or tried to. I wasn't thinking. She didn't frown, but there were tears in her gray eyes. She got to work, and it it did hurt. Bless you, Mom. But it hurt. At least most of my wounds were in the front, so she didn't have to flip me over too much. She spoke to me. I know who did this to you. I groaned. And I know why, too. The rest of the conversation came out in piecemeal, in between pulling out pellets or stitching up cuts or setting bones. The Grand Masons, the man behind the man behind the normal folks. I bet Grigory spilled the beans on you. I was gearing up for an attack, but I guess it worked out since I would have been too late. I don't know. It ain't easy, Jack. It ain't easy. She didn't talk for a bit. Well, it's true. I was part of a collective of women who abandoned modern living for something more au natural. Can't show you those pictures, no, no. Your father, he and his men came by, looking for something. Can't remember what. Something to do with ley lines, but ley lines are bull with mortals, so it came to nothing. Your father, he, well, he was a sweet talker. and I groaned as loudly as I could. I didn't really understand the point of the story, but I hoped she would continue on. Tell me his name. I begged her without words, staring straight into her eyes. She looked embarrassed. How old had she been when she met him? Had me. Look, I was a girl and not a woman, and he talked and talked me sweet. Better than my parents ever did, before Daddy left. And I was stupid. 
I can't, not even now with all this time and the blood and the hue. She stopped. It was a harsh look on her face, but mostly for herself. I found a strength and groaned again. Please! You need to know, and I should have told you years ago. Your father's name is Jeremiah Pike. He is the Grand Master of the Grand Masons. His title is something like True King of the Nestorian Kingdom, the Secret Keeper of Solomon's Seventy and Seven Keys, and the Three Hundred and Thirty-Three Keys of the Prophet Muhammad in the Storehouse of the Six Hundred and Sixty-Six Spells of the Templars. He's combined a few offices. He shouldn't. The keys aren't real, and the spells are just strange wisdoms he distributed to hide how he was... Uh, I've been hunting him for years, tearing little bits of his organization down piece by piece. I can barely explain how he keeps that leadership, much less what happens in his rituals. It isn't enough just to burn down Masonic lodges. They might be attempting to pull as many people from Christ as they can, but they aren't the real threat. People who want to be lost, get lost. It's the Grand Masons. The old men above Pike, supposedly, want to replace God and rule the world. They think they can beat Satan, but they figure he'll give them power if they serve. And it's not logical. It's all lies. Jeremiah, though, he's got his own thing going, and I've never been able to find any hints of it. It starts with you. I'll tell you about your birth. Jeremiah got me hot and bothered because I was stupid and I was young, and I gave in to him. He pulled all kinds of spells and blood over me, and I thought it was very cool because he was mysterious. And have I mentioned that your mother was very, very stupid when she was young? Well, I became pregnant. It wasn't bad for me at first. The delusion was strong. The commune my parents started was very deep in the apocalypse lore that was pretty big around the 70s. Some guru from India predicted the end of the world and utopia after, as long as you live through it. That's where I got all my survival skills and learn how to hide from government agents who might object to girls and boys running around the woods naked and throwing flowers over a Baphomet statue. It's important for what comes next. Well, I brought you to term. And you popped out a baby boy that was so pink and wonderful and so hot and so wonderful. Jeremiah had told me you were going to be sacrificed. That the gods would be appeased by you and Every blessing and ten more kids and beauty and youth and... She sat down next to me, the job mostly done. She was crying. And everything you'd think a young girl could be fooled by. She grabbed my hand. And that's when I saw you, pink and screaming and full of life. And you clung to me so warm like you had a fire in you that would never quit. That you'd never quit no matter the cost if only you... He lived long enough. So, as I held you, while the men and women left me so I could prepare the baptism of blood and Bacchus wine, I swallowed you, put on what I could, gathered what I could, and ran into the night, half-naked, bleeding, and more desperate than I had ever been before. And what a night that was. The stars were so close I could see planets circling them. Things with eyes were watching over the compound built into the mountain. They saw me go. Some frowned, some laughed for joy, but did nothing to help or hinder me. Shadows and night things gibbered at me, promising me I couldn't understand. If, if only I'd give you up, I could have it all. I refused all offers and ran on. Does and she-wolves surrounded me and ran with me. The wolves howled and the deer made their calls. I was terrified. I, I knew nothing. I barely understood what you were. I, I ran until morning. Sometimes I saw the flares of searchers. Other times, large beasts and foul things hunted me. By the end of it, I was exhausted, huddled in a cave, surrounded by a pack of wolves. I think I slept for two days. A she-wolf might have suckled you, or else God would let you survive without needing food. I, I don't know. 
I had given birth and then ran all night. For my body, you know how thin I am. I should have died. At the end of the third day, I left the cave. I was guided from the mountains to the forests. The next year was a blur of caves and disease and terror. Sometimes there were kindness, people who gave me food and clothes and something for you. Other times I was driven away and I had to pray that I'd find anything, something, enough to give you some milk or anything you could put down. People would call the police so I could get help, but it just led the Grand Masons to me every time. I escaped my pursuers. Once, when you were three months old, I nearly suffocated you as men passed over my head, walking up and down a bridge. We were deep in the mud, and you had been scratched by something. You kept crying as they got closer. I was more scared that you were going to die there, but if, if I didn't... They turned, just as I couldn't bear it anymore. Finally, I came across a paranormal Pinkerton, Keith Robur. I was being hunted by a clone of the questing beast. Its long head bent this way and that, smelling for me. It had slain wolves that had attacked it in the night, sacrificing themselves to save me. It was massive, like a real dragon, but without wings. It wasn't the real deal. It looked unhealthy, but its teeth and claws were still sharp. It could push over trees in the way. If I could outlast it, outrun it. No... It was too strong, too tireless. Keith came out of nowhere. He shot it up with a Tommy gun and disabled it, but not its head, which lived with a life of its own. It grappled him, but he was a strong man, and I could tell that Keith was of the earth and could master beasts. It's like how I, I don't worry about you, even though I know I should. I can tell you're never going to stop fighting while you have strength that... Well... That's why I saw Jeremiah as powerful and mysterious and charming, but that last bit was all him. Keith broke its neck, looking like a hero of old, back straining, foot on the lower jaw, and arm on the upper, ripping it apart at the seams. The poison and bites got to him, but before he died he gave me enough information to reach control. The old one, not the new girl, her daughter. She pulled strings, and I found out that Orion Morrow, my, my father, reconciled with his father, Thomas Morrow, and the two of them were searching the world for me, always one step behind. The three of us got back together and set up a base where I could raise you, and then set about making as many false trails as we could. The 1911, that was Tom's. He got a real laugh out of being called Tom Morrow tomorrow. He was a real funny guy. Fought in World War II in one of the anti-Obscura Corps divisions that worked with Days, the Paranormal Pinkertons, and the Société Étranger, those groups that didn't go with the Vichy government. Tom talked about it in his journals. He used to write them about Orion's mother, a Greek girl he saved from an Obscura Corps ritual. I wish I could give them to you, but they got captured years ago. We really don't have the time. I wish I, I could have given you a more normal life. Even if I had to be a waitress or, or something to scrimp and save or marry again or... Jack, could you forgive me for your childhood? You were so lonely. I had to keep you safe, but I saw you how you acted with the other kids. I sent you off to be trained by the old Shawnee because Tom and Orion were dead. He was a bastard, but you needed the skills to survive. I arranged your job with the Pinkertons through control because I didn't know how to prepare you for a normal life. If Otraterre left tomorrow morning with the sunrise, I, I don't know how you would function. And now you're 30 years old. No family, no wife, not even a bastard to take your name. You're just living killing everything you're set to kill because you don't know anything else. That isn't any way to live. She squeezed my hand and I squeezed back. I didn't. I, I don't understand her words. I need to leave Abdul the Diviner away from here. After that, I'm going to go and try and break the hold the Grand Masons have over you. Break the lines of magic and fate that bind you to the demons you were meant to be given to. I'm going to have to go to some deep 
dark places. She hooked up some IV bags, checked her work, patching me up. At least you don't have any broken legs. That would be real bad. She flashed me a smile. It was out of place on her usually severe face. I realized that she had shown more emotion now than in all the years of my childhood. Jack, I love you more than life itself. Please tell me that if you ever have an opportunity to love and live and produce children, you'll take it. With both hands. She put her hand in mine and I squeezed it. Good. She kissed my forehead. Your daddy should have told you this, or your grandfather, or Tom Morrow. Somebody who is, isn't your mother, but you are a real man. Never forget that you are a man. You aren't a sacrifice, you aren't a dog, you aren't a monster. You're a man. She laid her hands on me and was silent for a long while. She put the 1911 in my hands and put it over my chest. I wish my father could see you and bless you now. Listen, I might not make it back. We might never see each other again. I hope we do. We didn't see each other enough. Bye, Jack Morrow, my son. May God protect you. And never let evil get away with anything if you have the power. Make evil pay. With that blessing, she left me alone. I heard her scraping something up above, hiding the entrance. I spent days in a fever which didn't break really for weeks. I could barely sit up and get medicine from the chest side of my cot. There was food, MREs, but good flavors at least, and a chamber pot, water too. I heard a lot of things out there, strange sounds, things snuffling at the entrance, then running away. Hunting horns, whispers. The dreams were the worst of it, Bob and Jim floating there looking at me. I could tell they were asking if their deaths were going to be wasted or if I would pull through. I felt bad about them. Still do. When all this calms down, I'm finding their families and doing what I can. It won't be much, but I'll do what I can. I can't spend too much time on them, but I wish I could. After four weeks, I made the first report so you'd know I was still alive. Grigory Horvath tracked me here because he knows how I think and hates me for what his daughter did to his hand. There was a bolt hole and I made my way out. It's been cat and mouse for the last few weeks, but I won, and Grigory has been encouraged to stay out of my way. There hasn't been anything from my mom since then, but the way Grigory's acted, I believe she won her fight. I've had a lot of time to think and a lot of fever to burn, and I'm making my decision. It's time to come together. Sean, Jim, I've already sent you coordinates and instructions. Drop what you're doing and come on the date I put down. I've already mentioned several code words. Follow the clues. I'll be waiting. Be stealthy and burn what you don't take with you. We're going after control. Come ready with everything you'll need. We're not coming back until we have control or her body. If she's a corpse, we're going to make them pay one group at a time. Pinkertons have been bottom rung for too long. It's time to remind all of Otraterre that we've always punched far above our weight. We'll remind them with blood, lead, and enough fire to put the fear of hell back into them. If we're going to go down, we're going down swinging. I'll be waiting. Jack Morrow. Out! Pingerton's Ghosts is a podcast distributed by Superversive Radio and licensed under an attribution, non-commercial, share-alike, international license. This episode was written and performed by Ben Wheeler, who also edits, directs, produces, and herds cats. Ken Dickinson is our audio editor. Visit us on Facebook, read articles on SuperversiveSF.com, and wherever podcasts are distributed, you'll find us. Contact us through Twitter at Pinkerton's Ghosts. Support us on Patreon or email us at PinkertonsGhosts at gmail.com. Be sure to check out our unauthorized episodes as well. Thank you 
for listening.